Hello, welcome to Breaking All Down. I am Count Zero, and this is not the next episode of Nintendo Power Perspectives. That episode is still coming. Due to senior project stuff coming up in the coming term, things are probably going to slow down a little bit. However, I do intend to keep the show coming. I might slow things down to a one episode per month level, but the episode, I'll still be putting out episodes. Um, I also, what I might do is maybe tr switch things up a little bit, because we're in 1990 now, and other video game magazines have started coming up. We had, in the history of video games, particularly retro video games, a gap after the crash where there wasn't a lot of game magazine coverage. We were still getting coverage of video games, but they were more in the PC space. We would see a games column in Antic Magazine for an Atari enthusiast, or uh, PC magazines, or that sort of thing. So, we're gonna kind of drum and trade things up a little bit, uh, particularly because my senior projects involve Nintendo Power and the Nintendo Power Top 30 and Top 20. Because of that, um, my Nintendo focus is kind of going to be on that and where I am in Nintendo Power Magazine. So what I might do is I might go back and, before I did the Nintendo Power recaps, the print recaps on my blog uh, and these videos, I did a recap of Electronic Gaming Monthly Magazine. I might do that. Um, I'm also interested in taking a look at Video Games and Computer Entertainment, which is a very short-lived retro video game magazine that was published by Larry Flint. You might know him as the publisher of Hustler magazine, um, and who was subject to an obscenity trial. So, that would be interesting to see kind of how, if an adult magazine publisher decides, okay, we're going to do a serious gaming magazine, what type of magazine is that like tonally? Not just in terms of discussing the games, reviewing the games themselves, but also much more interesting to talk, to talk about the advertisements. Um, back when I was in doing a thread on RPG Net and kind of on my blog about uh, Heavy Metal Magazine, there was a similar thing where I, was, I kind of talked a lot about the advertisements in that magazine, who was advertising in Heavy Metal, um, and what was being advertised, and how was it being advertised, and that sort of thing. How much of this was house ads for other magazines, other products of the parent company, who also published National Lampoon. That sort of thing. Um, so that's going to be an interesting thing to discuss. Um, so, other than that, um, well, I saw a movie the other night. I saw The Hobbit, Part 3, The Battle of the Five Armies. Now, I did not do a vlog on Desolation of Smaug, because when I saw that one, it was on DVD. Um, so... I'm going to talk a bit about that here and give some discussions about Desolation. This my thoughts on um, Battle of the Five Armies without getting too much of the spoilers because it's only been out in theaters for a week. Uh, then, time permitting, I do have a bit of video game discussion to do for a recent video game for the 3DS. And which I can't do screenshot reviews of because, well... Once again, I can't capture 3DS video. I might adjust that. I might adjust my perk levels to my reward levels to being it to um, having a 3DS that can do game capture. But anyway, Hobbit. So, got some of my exposure and my my impressions of the Hobbit series film series. Uh, Peter Jackson's take on the Hobbit is kind of colored by the fact that my first exposure to The Hobbit, before I even read the book, was the Rankin-Bass animated production, which was animated by Topcraft. Topcraft also animated, um, among other things, the, um, at the film version of The Last Unicorn, and a number of the staff members who worked on that project also went on to join Studio Ghibli um, after working on Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. They also worked on Thundercats. Um, so, now, now mind you, Thundercats did have problems, particularly with lots of reused footage, but that's more a Western 
cost-cutting thing, a rank and bass cost-cutting thing, than anything on the animation staff. So I kind of I don't blame them for that part of the problems of Thundercats. But anyway, so I enjoyed the first two movies for, for kind of different reasons. Um, part one and part two both work very well with kind of the more playful elements of Tolkien's work. The Hobbit was born, it was Tolkien trying to write a heroic kid story, inspired by works like Princess and the Goblin, and other similar sort of fairy stories when he was a kid, uh, that he read when he was a kid, in which he'd read to his children, with the difference being that um, Tolkien, of course, being a professor of linguistics and being heavily inspired by Old English myth and Norse myth and that sort of thing. Toss those bits of banter in there, and it, it, it works. Um, the movie, both movies, kind of got some criticism related to having the silly playfulness combined with the horror, and serious, and dark tone and violence. I didn't really have a problem with that. I mean, I'm of the generation where Mortal Kombat came out. After I was in grade school, Mortal Kombat came out. One of my memories of third grade was when my classmates brought a Game Gear to school with Mortal Kombat in it, and he'd show off the blood code, and even do fatalities or that sort of thing. I mean, it, it, keep in mind, it's the Game Gear version of Mortal Kombat. So it's not fully up to snuff. The um, battery life of the Game Gear is notoriously poor, so he couldn't show it off for very long, but I do remember these things that part of my childhood. So I'm, growing up, I kind of recognize that kids kind of like to be scared. I mean, they'll, I mean, depending, if, if something is too much for them, they'll have nightmares and something afterwards, but they will go into something knowing it's scary um, because it's scary. They'll go into something knowing it's, they, they'll they appreciate a certain degree of violence. I mean, the kid, the cool kids in school are the ones whose kids let, whose parents let them watch um, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And that sort of thing. And they were able, these are kids who were able to tell, okay, the, the, the violence of this, it's not real, it's fictional, but, uh, and, and they don't know it's supposed to be horrific, but on the other hand, they kind of, they, they do have a certain degree of appeal in that, not in like a sociopathic way or that sort of thing. Um, so I can understand kids being able to go with and kind of tolerate a certain degree of violence and, I've always found it kind of silly and stupid that when I was a kid that the network censors and that sort of thing wouldn't let your kids shows have death. You couldn't say the character died. You couldn't, um, you, you, you'd have like on G.I. Joe, you'd have all the Cobra guys eject at the last second. Um, I didn't like how in the English dub for Dragon Ball Z that they on television back in the day, that you weren't killed, you were blown into another dimension, or is it being sent to hell, you're sent to the dark dimension like in Yu-Gi-Oh. So, I appreciate, I appreciate it, as a, even as a kid, works that treated me with respect in that way. They acknowledged death, acknowledged repercussions of death. They were, and they're willing to do action where, yeah, um, to a certain degree, yeah, it's kind of violent and grotesque, where you'd have, um, like, in the hot, in, Part one, on the unexpected journey, you'd have you'd have the dwarves running through Goblin Town, lopping off the heads of goblins off one after another. But I was kind of okay with that. I was kind of okay with the grotesque looks on the, on, on the goblins in terms of it with kids seeing this, because it it never really felt. I mean, the, the tone all kind of worked for me. It's kind of hard to put the full thing for why the tone worked for me in the words. Um, but it meshed with what I was okay with, what I remember my peers being okay with as a kid. So, unless kids today are more squeamish than they were when I were a kid, I think they could, I figured they could handle it. Um, for... Part two, Desolation of Smaug. We had some moments which were more 
cartoony. Like Bombor rolling around from um um basically being a sort of Katamari of Death um as the dwarves were escaping from the uh, elves the wood elves and a bunch of other elements of that action scene and Legolas Legolasing as Legolas always does and all that sort of thing. Um but all the elements of that film worked great. I always thought Benedict Cumberpatch was fantastic as Smaug. Uh, the reveal of the Necromancer as Sauron was excellently done. Um, and I feel that the film ended on sort of the right Empire Strikes Back note of we know bad things are about to happen and, pe and characters aren't necessarily a good place to take care of it. Having seen uh, the Lord of the Rings films before this, we know some characters are going to get out okay. Gandalf's going to get out fine. Um, Bilbo's going to get out fine. Um, theoretically, we know, oh, um, Wallen's Wall going to get out fine, assuming that and they know, know they said that Gimli's already been born, so theoretically, Dwalin can still die. If you hadn't read the book, you're like, oh, Dwalin can still die. A lot of these other dwarves can still die. Dwalin, we know at least, is going to make it because he has to die in Moria. That sort of thing. Um, so, the movie ended on the right kind of downer note. The, the, the Empire Strikes Back downer note. Things are dark, but maybe it's going to be turned around. We know that there's the loose scale, there's the bald spot on the chest of Smaug, and if um, Bard can hit it, or somebody can hit it, then they can, t they can take Smaug down. So, we're set up for an interesting point here. Um, and... Honestly, I'd say Battle of the Five Armies pay, pays off everything well, without giving too much into spoilers. Um, and actually, the film does a good job of taking some moments that were from that, that were added and taking the characters of Legolas and Tariel, who were not from the book, and making their role in the film serve an important narrative purpose. Um, to explain some things that Tolkien kind of messed up. Just, just an example. Um, in the book, for the five armies, Tolkien kind of cheats. In the book, the five armies are humans, dwarves, and elves. Fine there. Orcs. Okay, we're good. And wargs. But it's kind of a cheat because the orcs are riding wargs. That's like saying a cavalry unit is actually two units because you have the humans and the horses. That's that's cheating. That's not legit. You're, 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 you're padding things. You're inflating things. The movie goes, okay, we're going to have two forces of orcs, two armies of orcs involved here. They're uh, working together in the same way we have the same way that the humans and the dwarves and the elves are going to have to work together to resist the orcs. We have, um, we have Azog the Defiler, Defiler's army of Moria orcs, uh, who have been, uh, working against our heroes from the very beginning of the series. And now we have, um, have him working with Bolg, who is the leader of orcs out of Gundabad, in uh, at the gateway of the, the entrance to Angmar, as in the Witch King of Angmar, um, where he's from, and so that's interestingly done. And the, and the reason those group of orcs get involved is a payoff of everything that's been going on with Legolas and Toriel, particularly in Lake Town, from the end of the first um, movie, where we have basically. Azog, who, by the way, this movie kind of pays off everything and makes him, shows how smart of a character he is, goes, okay, we can take on 
with certainty. Two of these armies, humans and dwarves, humans and elves, maybe even both elves and dwarves, but not all three. And because the elves in Lake Town got away, they're going to go send warning to Tori to um, the Wood Elves. The, the elves bring the elves in, so we, we and we know the dwarves are going to come, and we know the humans are going to be there. So we need backup. So we'll, so we'll, we'll we'll bring in Bulg from uh, Gundabad, and we'll set up, and I'll set up a clever strategy that uses these forces. Um, to make things more interesting, and to um, and to make it so that we have to have a chance of winning, and we can we can take um, we can take Erebor. I do kind of wish in the movie um, there are some things I wish they hadn't done. I wish they had um, wish they had. Um, for Gandalf, he kind of lays out why he wanted the dwarves to retake Erebor, why he pushed them on here. He has a motivation beyond just wanting to help the dwarves. Um, it is not the one which is kind of the iconic, I wouldn't say the iconic, but the um, sort of long-standing Tolkien fan theory for why the dwarves were, why he was helping the dwarves, which, or at least why he wanted to get Smaug dead is the only thing worse than just an independent dragon in this dragon is an independent dragon allied with Sauron. And the dragons were go back to the history of the Cimmerillion were allies of Morgoth and, and servants of Morgoth. And Sauron was Morgoth's number two, his closest general. So in theory while Smaug wouldn't necessarily wake up and go out off to war for anybody, he might do that for Sauron. Um, might. So Gandalf doesn't want that, hence getting, um, hence kind of helping the dwarves along their way. The movie gives an additional version for the, uh, reason for this, which I don't want to get too much into. It makes sense. A good, it's a, it's a good reason. But I would have liked if if the if we given some lip service to the and also we don't want Sauron allied with a dragon reason in the film. Other things with the Enchant, there are some iconic lines from the book which I like, which are as kind of important to me as um, some of the lines from Lord of the Rings of. Um, for example, Eowyn's I am no man. That those lines are iconic and important, and a couple of the of those lines from The Hobbit, particularly from this portion of the story, are missing. Um, I do like that. They kind of change Gandalf's also his intervention from how it was in the book. Gandalf in the book, it's kind of it, it is kind of how it was in the Rankin Bass version, where the army is about to meet in the middle of the field, and Gandalf basically kind of parks himself in between the three armies and says, "Listen up, orcs are coming. You're going to work together to take on the orcs." Period. Thibbeth. And they go with that. In the movie, it's a much more involved process, and I do like that. Also, in the movie, you know, like any spoilers, um, one of the characters from the book who's introduced this late in the story is um, Dane, the cousin of um, Thorin. Dane is the king of the dwarves in the Iron Hills. And he shows up with... He's the one who brings in the dwarf army. Because, I mean, 12 guys isn't much of an army. Uh, and he's played by Billy Connolly in this movie. And Billy Connolly does an excellent job with the role. He is a very, very good actor. 
and he does a great job with his character without making him too over the top and too silly. Appreciate that. All right. So, let's not get into without getting into spoilers. So, let's talk a bit about new, about new Super Mario Brothers 2 for the 3DS. So, here's the thing with new Super Mario Brothers 2. If you played New Super Mario Brothers, good news! It's more of that. If you liked that, you're set. They add a new po some new power-ups here related to the fact that the game is a leaderboard thing based on how many total coins you've collected as you've gone through the game. The problem is... Narratively, and I realize narrative has not been the strong suit of the Mario series since ever. But narratively, once again, Princess Peach has been kidnapped, Mario has to go out and rescue her. With that, combined with the collect as many coins as possible thing, feels kind of stuffed in. Particularly since each level, rather than collecting stars or whatever, you're collecting special golden coins. And the thought, a well, red coin, the thought about the head is, you know... There's this Mario bad guy who hasn't been used in a while. He's kind of big bad. He's a couple times been the focus of his own game. He is a recur he's appeared a lot in Smash Brothers. He's pretty popular. He's also appeared in Mario Kart. Um, I don't know how to remember his name. He had his own spin-off series. He had a whole bunch of mini games related to him. Oh, oh, what's his name? Oh, it's right there. Oh, right, Wario. Wario's whole shtick is a greedy schmuck. He's the evil Mario, he, you know he's evil because the the M has been turned upside down to a W. And he's got a big, more exaggerated kind of twisty mustache that has got curls on it so he can twist it and curl it because that's what you, that's the sign of an evil bad guy. The only thing he's, he, I think he even has a goatee. Just to kind of put a clincher on the, oh hey, he's evil thing. Is he know he's, he's evil Mario? He's the dark mirror, the mirror universe Mario, because he's got an evil guy goatee. So. And his whole shtick is money. When he first appeared in Super Mario Land 2, six golden coins for the Game Boy, his whole shtick was he'd stolen, um, he'd brainwashed all of basically the employees of Mario Theme Park, Mario Land, what have you, and he'd taken all of Mario's money to show Mario who's boss. And theoretically, for this game, you could just do that. You could you could have Wario rip off um, the treasury of the Mushroom Kingdom that um, that Toad runs in one day and says, Oh my gosh! Mario! Princess! The treasury is gone! Wario's stolen it! Oh no! Whatever will we do? And you have your game. Because stories has not been the strongest suit. It's a thin justification for a series to put a series of levels together. So here's your, there, there's your perfect thin justification. It gives you a narrative justification for collecting all those coins. Oh, and better! It lets you do something you haven't done that Nintendo hasn't done since Super Mario Bros. 2, the U.S. release, or Super Mario Bros. U.S., as released, released in Japan, you can have Princess Peach be a playable character. You can do four-player play, Mario, Luigi, Toad, Princess, just like back in the old days, with each one having their own distinct jumps, because Luigi jumps a little higher, maybe moves a little slower than Mario. Um, Toad runs a little faster, doesn't jump as high as after the two, Peach, slowest of them all, but she's got the glide, all this wonderful stuff. Different jump. I mean, we don't have the pull weight and carry rate like you had from Mario 2, but you can still have each of the characters play different ways, which makes the gameplay more interesting, which innovates on the gameplay. Because one of the, it used to be the big thing Nintendo was the big gameplay innovator. And they still kind of are. Super Mario Galaxy added the whole round, sort of level thing, and the sort of gravity surface thing, and also leading to different camera angles and that sort of stuff, and that was great. Um, Super Mario Sunshine, for all that game's faults, had the interesting idea of the water jets and the jetpack, which changes the verticality of the levels, and all this other stuff, and it's wonderful, it's great. It has a really good idea, it really innovates on the Mario concept. Mario 64 
kind of really the first big 3D platformer, the one which got it right. And, hell, Super Mario 3D Land on the 3DS, which uses the 3D to make for interesting puzzles based on, based on perspective and using optical illusions and that sort of thing. Nintendo has demonstrated they're willing to innovate in this franchise on this platform with Mario. With the new Super Mario Brothers games, it'd be interesting there's the potential there to innovate, to do new and interesting things, and to revive old mechanics which were promising and which made some of the earlier games distinct and redo them now with some new twists on them to make things more interesting or more fun. And this game was an opportunity to do that. For that matter, the new Super Mario Bros. games on the Wii U and the Wii provide the potential to do that, but that hasn't really been done. There hasn't, to my knowledge, None of the new Super Mario Brothers games, not on the handhelds, not on consoles, has been willing or able to include Princess Peach as a character to, and in the, as a consequence, include the idea of different characters with different jump, with, with radically different jumping styles, because, and, and different play mechanics, because really, Princess Toadstool's float changes everything about that character and how it plays related to other characters. They've never been to do that on, in this game series, which is disappointing. Because as much as I enjoy the classic Mario platforming action, and as much as I enjoy platformers, which is a lot, seeing them change things up in new ways is even more appealing. And I really wish, I really, really wish that... Should we get a new Super Mario Bros. 3, either on handheld or console or whatever, that Nintendo goes, you know what? You're right. We're bringing Toadstool back as a playable character. We're bringing the float back. And we're going to do interesting things with our level designs and how we approach these levels and what you can access based on these jump mechanics and how these characters affect the jump and how the way these characters play affect how, their, how they control and that sort of thing. So... Kind of gotten that rant out of the way. Feel free to support my page, Patreon. Link is in the show notes, or the URL will be in the closing credits of this episode. Um, new Nintendo Power Retrospectives is still on the way. Should be ready and done by next week, so hopefully by Christmas Eve you will get that as your early Christmas present. Um, and that pretty much covers all the bases. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.